Welcome everyone to the conference, Our Story, Their Story, Recalling Women in Auschwitz and uh, During the Holocaust. I am uh, Mordechai Paldiel, a child survivor, and I currently teach uh, as a junk professor at uh, the Holocaust and the History of Zionism at Yeshiva University, Stern College, and Tour College in New York. From 1982 to 2007, for 24 years, I headed the Righteous Among the Nations Department at Yad Vashem, during which time uh, thousands of rescuers were added to the list of righteous Gentiles, honored by the State of Israel. I have also written books and articles on that subject. And now I want to introduce uh, Professor Bowman Schwartz. Professor Judy Tido Bowman Schwartz is the director of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University in Israel. She specialized in Holocaust studies, particularly women and the Holocaust, and has written extensively on the subject. Together with Dalia Offer, she edited a recently published book, Her Story, My Story, writing about women in the Holocaust, which was an outgrowth of the Women Recall the Holocaust Forum that she established in 2018 at the Finkler Institute and a springboard for this conference. Professor Bobel Schwarz. Thank please. you, Mordechai, for your kind words, and thank you all for joining us here today. I'd like to begin by thanking the Museum of Jewish Heritage, which is co-sponsoring this conference, and especially for Samantha Shokin, the Manager of Public Programs, for all her assistance in putting this conference together. I'd like to thank our audience and our participants of the forum that Mordechai mentioned, the Women Recall the Holocaust Forum of the Finkler Institute of Bar-Ilan University. Together, we created the book, Her Story, My Story, Writing About Women in the Holocaust, this book, which was the inspiration for holding this conference. I especially want to thank my co-editor, Professor Dahlia Ofer, for her friendship, her expert professional knowledge in all fields. Working with Dahlia is a privilege, and I never forget when I have a pleasure of working with her, how wonderful joint projects with her are. I'd like to thank our moderators, Professor Marianne Kaplan and Professor Frederica Schoman for their willingness to moderate, and most of all, to keep everyone to their time limits. I'm supposed to tell you a bit about how it all began, which means we're talking about origins. So let's go back to how this began. This conference is the outgrowth of a book. The book is an outgrowth of a forum, and the forum is actually an outgrowth of a meeting that I had in Jerusalem close to 30 years ago with Sarah Horowitz. Sarah, I don't know if you remember this, but we sat in a Jerusalem cafe and I talked about my dream. My dream at the time was to put some type of a network together for all of the people who working on the topic of women in the Holocaust. At the time, Sarah told me, that's a great idea, but there aren't too many of us. And how are you gonna find us? How are you gonna find all these people? So many haven't yet published on the topic. They're just beginning to work, but the idea is great. So Sarah, at the time you were correct, it was really impossible to put it together then, but I never forgot the idea. At the time I was teaching, wherever I was teaching, and I was teaching the subject, and I felt very much alone. There was almost no one in Israel who was doing it together with me. I took heart from some of my friends in other places in the world, particularly the United States, who were already working on the topic. One of them, the late Sybil Milton, gave me a tremendous amount of encouragement and said, one day you're going to put something like that together. Fast forward to the mid-1990s. In 1995, I think it was, Dahlia Ofer and Lenny Weitzman put together a conference in Jerusalem that gave me the opportunity for the first time to connect with scholars worldwide who were working on the topic of women and the Holocaust. It was there and around that time that I met Marian Kaplan, Atina Grossman, Joan Ringelheim, and saw that there were top scholars working on the subject in various places in the world. Some of us published books during that decade. And the topic began to take off. It began to be taught in various colleges and universities in the United States, in Israel, and Europe, throughout the world. I'm not gonna delve into the Schoenfeld polemic of the time, 
which unfortunately did affect the lives and the careers of some of the women working on the subject and affected their trajectories. It didn't deserve the attention that it gets now in some of our writings. At the time, it was important. However, I jumped to the millennium and soon after. By 2000, the subject was becoming more and more mainstream. More and more women were working on the topic. I had the privilege of missing Melissa Raphael at least four times that I came to England and we were trying to get together. She was working on the subject from the theological aspect. We kept missing each other, but we kept writing to each other. It was during that decade that I met other women who were working on it. Um, Rochelle Seidel, Esther Herzog, Esther Fuchs, Inza Eschebach, Sharon, um, Geva, Namashik, a few others. And I think that we all encourage each other that what we were doing was right. And that encouragement was very, very important. The next step is again, fast forward to autumn 2018, when I became the head of the Finkler Institute of Holocaust Research at Bar Ilan University. For the first time, I had the framework where I could do what I wanted about forums, putting together networks of people working on topics, dealing with the Holocaust throughout the world. The first topic that I decided to put people together on was the topic of women. And that's when we founded the first forum, Women Recalling the Holocaust. That's where the idea of the book came from. In 2018, at that time, I was already working on a similar book with a different group. There I was just a writer. It was a book of ego documents or memoirs having to do with people who studied State of Israel studies. And I saw what they were doing. Who are the people behind the studies? And I said, hey, that's something that we should do. Who are the women behind women writing about women and the Holocaust? It's a combination of history, historiography, and historiosophy together. As I like to tell my students, history is what happened. Historiography is what was written about what happened. Historiosophy is why did the people who write what happened write what they did? And this is basically what we did in our book. Not only what we wrote about, but why us? How did we get there? What did we do? And once again, this book, which is the product of all of our scholarship, is the result. It's analytical, and at the same time, it was a very exciting and eventful project. I think that we all got a lot out of it. It started a year after the project in stable care of the historians working on Israel studies, and we actually had our book out three months before they did. So that, my friends, is how it all began. And now we're going to hear where it went from there. Mordechai, back to you. Thank you, thank you. Uh, and now I turn to uh, Marion Kaplan. I'll say a few words. Marion Kaplan is a Skirball Professor of Modern Jewish History at uh, NYU. She is a three-time National Jewish Book Award winner for books about the making of German Jewish middle class, Jewish life in Nazi Germany, and gender and Jewish history. In October 2008, I had the pleasure to listen to Marion Kaplan at a conference at uh, Columbia University on gender in uh, Nazi Germany. Uh, and I thank you very much uh, for uh, this conference. So, Professor Marion Kaplan, it's your turn. Go ahead. Thank you very much. Hello and uh, welcome to everybody. It's nice seeing you all. So I came of age with the modern feminist movement as well as with increased interest in Holocaust studies in the academy. But before going into our early journeys as we stepped into these topics, a historical reminder. Feminists may have propagated a gendered agenda but most of us did not know the questions about gender that had arisen long before. Polish historian Emanuel Ringelblum's collection of testimonies, reports, and surveys in the Warsaw Ghetto from 39 till 43, later known as the Onik Shabbat Project, asked questions of and about women, and many women participated in this undertaking. Philip Friedman, a Polish Jewish historian, who survived Lvov in hiding, set a gendered agenda for future research as early as 1945. And even some survivors early on addressed the issue of gender roles. Skipping to my generation, there's also a context. Research on Jewish women did not occur in a void. 
By the mid-1970s, American scholars of women's history began publishing titles such as The Jewish Woman, New Perspectives, or Becoming Visible, Women in European History. British historians, too, started to explore women in Nazi society, especially non-Jews. In the 1980s, American scholars continued to research non-Jewish German women. Research on Jewish women in the Nazi era therefore coincided with and was greatly influenced by the scholarship of women's history as well as its entry and women's entry into the academy. I would like to mention philosopher and feminist theorist Joan Ringelheim's challenge to Holocaust historians in the early 1980s to consider women in the Holocaust. For me, the conference that Ringelheim and Esther Katz organized in 1983, Women Surviving the Holocaust, was a path-breaking event. At points, we broke into small survivor groups. I took notes for one such session and recall my surprise and confusion when many survivors both rejected the salience of gender and also highlighted it. In other words, they denied there were any differences between men and women and then described those very differences. I thought then, and I still think, that many survivors did not want to support a feminist inquiry and yet hoped to tell their stories for posterity. That same year, Vera Alaska, herself a survivor, published her Women in the Resistance and the Holocaust using women's published testimonies. Feminist scholars of my generation asked, might women have experienced the Holocaust differently than men? And if so, in what ways? It seemed obvious on the one hand that young women, mothers or widows face different obstacles, maybe different opportunities than men in similar situations. Perhaps due to the popularity of the women's movement on American campuses, as well as in US society more generally, these discussions and debates emerged in the US first, but not for long. Our male elders and colleagues did not always greet our approach with open arms. Indeed, some simply found women's history unworthy, while others wondered why divide the victims. And still others worried aloud that women's historians were raising women's suffering above that of all Jews. Nothing could have been further from the truth, but we had to do the research. It took 12 years of intense research connecting women's history, memoirs, feminist theory, and the Holocaust until many of us met at the first International Women and Holocaust Conference organized by Dahlia O'Fair and Leonore Weitzman in 1995, which Judy just mentioned. Added, asked to make a summary comment at that meeting, I stated pointedly that this was, quote, not the feminist takeover of the Holocaust to the visible relief of one of the male attendees who gave me a thumbs up. Many more traditional, mostly male scholars, showed discomfort with the newer kinds of sources gender historians turn toward. In order to approach the subjects, we analyze sources unusual for those times. We acknowledge the importance of traditional sources like government or organizational archives and newspapers, but insisted on sources that brought us closer to women's lived experiences, memoirs, diaries, letters, and interviews that helped us understand the fears, strengths, values, and self-understandings of women and men. These materials also evoke the cultural context and the historical moments from enduring growing Nazi persecution through the ruthless descent into murder. Although these ego documents are not foolproof, glossing over details, exaggerating or forgetting at times, they filled in important and overlooked stories. They complicated Jewish reactions during the Holocaust and also challenged dominant narratives. For just one example, that there was only one kind of resistance. To paraphrase Anna Redding, quote, when a survivor gives an interview or writes a memoir, she offers us a life, a testament in the face of Nazi lies. She creates a memorial because in one story, we see many extinguished lives. I will stop here since this lays the groundwork and I expect many of our panelists will show us how these early forays have expanded methodologically and in terms of topics newly addressed. I look forward to learning from all of you. I would like to now introduce Pascal Bass. 
Professor Boss is an Associate Professor of German and Netherlandic Studies, Comp Lit, Jewish Studies, and Women and Gender Studies at the University of Texas at Austin. She works on cultural memory and gender in relation to traumatic events, and is a member of the International Working Group on Sexual Violence in Armed Conflict. So I turn it over to Pascal. And we each have seven minutes, I should add. So there is a time limit, and I will have to remind you of that. Every speaker has to unmute themselves. Yes, I apologize. Good. Um, first of all, I would like to thank Judy for organizing all of this. Um, for realizing that her idea that the creation of a forum of women whose scholarship focuses on gender and the Holocaust, and that even a book that explores our journeys into that research would be a possibility, and for making it happen, and for working so tirelessly on it. Um, never before have I been part of an edited volume that from start to finish was wrapped up this quickly and efficiently. And I think most of you can agree, it's phenomenal. Um, I'm also grateful that we get to do this today, um, despite the pandemic and albeit in virtual form. I would have much preferred to be at the Museum of Jewish Heritage uh, in New York City today and to have been able to see the exhibit on women in Auschwitz in person. Um, and to have been there with all of you, um, both my esteemed and uh, beloved colleagues, to discuss these topics. I think most of us agree that Indeed, the discussion of this material is what makes such forums so important. Unlike, I think, some of our uh, male colleagues, we are not espousing to sort of um, tout our theories in a vacuum. This is a really um, engaged dialogue. Um, especially in this spring and summer of 2020, marking the 75th anniversary of the end of World War II and the Holocaust, this is such an incredible, important moment of um, commemoration and uh, for so many of us, uh, not only because it represents um, a likely transition in our scholarship, as in the near future, we will no longer have the presence of Holocaust survivors among us, which moves uh, the recollection of these events definitively from communicative to cultural memory in the language of the scholar Jan Aswan, um, but personally as well, um, at this point, my mother, uh, a Jewish child survivor from Amsterdam, the Netherlands, is still alive, um, as is her partner, who has a young teen survived internment uh, in several places among others, Theresienstadt. They may not be in five years, and it's one of the reasons why not having uh, been able to have and, um, these commemorations and this particular anniversary in person has been very difficult for me. And, it would have been very nice to be in New York. Um, I'm still very glad we get to have this time together and I uh, hope that everybody's healthy and safe and remains so for the duration of this pandemic. Um, I went back to Judy's original question, um, whether, whether any of our work touched upon the experience of women in Auschwitz. Um, and thinking about that, um, I have to say that growing up in a family of Holocaust survivors, Auschwitz was for me, the camp where I conceived of men suffering and dying. Uh, my grandfather, first and foremost, uh, Gilles or Yuda, Yehuda, Isaac Ertemann, um, 31 years of age, brilliant, beloved physician, um, was murdered there in September of 1943. It is the camp that Primo Levi describes in such devastating detail in his memoir that I read sometime during the early 80s. The fact that it was also the camp where my grandmother's older sister, Susanna, and her son, Jakob, aged age, um, had been gassed upon their arrival in the summer of 1942, while her husband, Hyman, was selected to work, but of course would eventually be killed as well, was as of yet unclear to me. Or what it meant that her chances of survival as she arrived there together with her young son, my mother's cousin, had been zero or that had she survived, her experiences would have been different from those of a male inmate, such as my grandfather or Primo. None of that did occur to me yet. As so many other readers of Holocaust memoirs or ego documents, as they were called by Sam Dresden, 
where I grew up in the Netherlands. I did not question my, why nearly all of those published texts were written by men or how their experiences or memories may have differed from those of female inmates. And may does not necessarily have been representative of the female experience. That question came to me a little bit later when the different strands of my intellectual and personal life began to merge in my early 20s. As a passionate young feminist in Amsterdam, I had started reading literature by women and scholarship on women's literature in my late teens. As a university student in comparative literature and philosophy, I continued this work with a focus on gender and representation. Several years into that study, when the need to explore what my own Jewish family's very painful wartime experiences in the Netherlands meant to me, and exploring that became more urgent, I began to look at Holocaust literature and memoirs by female survivors specifically. The questions that I try to answer in my analysis of these works did not seem to fit anywhere in the Dutch European academic context. Holocaust studies beyond um, a narrow focus, really much more on um, Nazis and the Third Reich within the field of history, um, did not yet exist. And so I came to the US in the early 1990s to pursue precisely these kinds of questions. And in the US, I had the opportunity to immerse myself in an as of yet relatively new and burgeoning field of Holocaust gender studies. What followed and what I describe in the essay in the book was my own attempt at adding my own sort of theoretical perspective to that work, uh, a perspective that was initially quite critical of uh, the work that had been published a little bit earlier, but was meant to push the field forward in a number of ways. What I did in that work was sort of try to articulate a model from which to conceptualize the relevance of gender during the Holocaust whereby I suggested that gender matters not only and not always primarily in empirical terms, for example, how Jewish men and women were treated differently by the Nazi regime or how they responded, how they responded in different ways to this persecution based on gender, but that we ought to look at how gender profoundly inflects people's sense of self and self-definition. One more minute, please. Yeah, what I looked at is really how men and women internalize gender scripts and how this affects how we experience, perceive, recall, and express ourselves within and against deeply internalized and normalized culturally prescribed conceptions of gender. So that was the argument I made, that the question of gender is absolutely relevant, but we needed to look at it much more in terms of this internalized socialization and how that affects both experience, memory, and expression of that memory. What happened as a result of that work was a lot of engagement with uh, a number of you here today uh, present at this forum, uh, and sometimes uh, discussions that were difficult and that I couldn't really unpack why they were difficult and why they felt difficult for me personally. And so- I have to you, say thank you and yeah. have to move on. Do you want to just round up that last yeah. thought? Yeah, my last sentence is, so what Judy's uh, uh, um, volume gave me the opportunity to do was really to explore why it had been so difficult and in what sense it was also a really um, personal confluence of factors um, that made these conflicts both interesting and painful. Thank, thank you me. very much. I want to introduce Professor Myrna Goldenberg, who is Professor Emerita of Montgomery College. She uses memoirs and testimonies as well as a wide variety of histories to write about Jewish women's culture and how it affected their survival in ghettos and camps during the Holocaust. Before All Memory is Lost, Women's Voices from the Holocaust is her award-winning groundbreaking examination of Jewish women survivors who emigrated to Canada. Myrna. It's your turn. And please stick to the seven minutes. Thank you, Marion. Um, and I thank everyone who was involved in making this happen. It's wonderful. But I can't recall a time when I wasn't aware of what Nazis did to Jews. I'm an Ashkenazi Jew who was born and raised in Brooklyn in a building full of relatives and Lanslite who talked about the old country every now and then, but never with affection. These aunts, uncles, and cousins left the old country in the first decade of the 20th century and left part of the family 
behind when they came to the what they called the Golden Medina, the USA. All four grandparents brought photos of their family, mainly their parents, with them and hung them conspicuously on the living room walls. So they were present in my life for quite a long time. Skipping to the subject at hand. Decades later, in the early 80s, I accompanied my husband on a business trip to Vienna. We wanted to business, visit Auschwitz-Birkenau um, at the end of that week. But because of his high level of security, our government wouldn't allow it. He's a scientist. Instead, they offered us a trip to Mauthausen, a camp 102 miles from Vienna. It, it was called the worst, it was actually in the category three, which was, they called the worst category with a capital W. Prisoner lifespan was no more than three months. And the SS commandant of this, what we call atrocity complex, and his son were fond of sitting on the porch of the administration building and shooting prisoners as others might shoot rabbits. The embassy offered us a car to get there, and we drove along the Danube on a beautiful, clear, sunny, but bitterly cold day in February. It was a stunning ride, and we planned to stop for lunch on our way back to Vienna. We were in for a shock. A few hours at Mauthausen changed our plans and my life dramatically. We were the only visitors to the camp that morning, with the embassy briefing book in hand, we went through the barracks, the area for roll call, and the torture sites. In one building, I walked one way and my husband another. I walked into a room that seemed to be about 10 by 15, white tiles stained bluish halfway up the walls, and a grid of 16 shower heads above me. I knew immediately that this this must be the gas chamber, and I looked for drains on the floor. Although I later learned that there was one drain in the center of the room, I didn't see any at the time. And the next thing I knew, I was in a different building in a bathroom stall. I don't know how I got there or how long I was in the gas chamber. My husband said he heard me scream and he came to get me, but I have no recollection of that. What I remember was that I was afraid to get out of the stall because I was sure that there'd be a mean looking female guard on the other side of the door, ready to take me back to barracks. I finally, I don't know how long it took, left this rather large, clean, modern bathroom and met my husband in the hallway where he had been waiting for me. We left the camp and we drove wordlessly back to Vienna. We never stopped for coffee. When we retired for the night, I found myself back in the gas chamber. Before I closed my eyes, I was in the gas chamber. And that happened for weeks on end. I felt paralyzed, but I knew I had to move on. Teaching was what I did. So I was determined to prepare myself to teach a course on the Holocaust. I immersed myself in all the literature I could find in English, and I began the work of learning whatever I could about the Holocaust. I felt that if I could feel secure in my knowledge, I could manage to teach. I did teach actually at Montgomery College, UMBC, uh, Sice at Hopkins. And eventually I met two wonderful scholars at the Holocaust Museum in Washington, Sybil Milton, now deceased, and Joan Ringelheim, now retired. And we began to ask the question, where are the women? there was a considerable bunch of memoirs by men whose names you would recognize, but it was very, very, very hard to find any published work by women. I scoured used bookstores looking for old out of print women's memoirs, and I found some. In fact, when we discovered women's memoirs, we meaning feminist scholars who were working on the topic, we were met with skepticism and hostility and derision when we talked about them at conferences. Actually, um, she, he was mentioned already, Schoenbaum of, of the of, uh, commentary. He accused us of trivializing the subject by studying it at the academy, and worse, by focusing on women. Who did we think we were?
It's hard to believe, but so many of our pairs, peers never thought to think about women and it shouldn't have been a surprise. Consider history. If we focused on other particularities of the Holocaust, how could we not focus on the particularity of gender? How could we assume that what happened to men also happened to women when we knew that men and women were separated in concentration and labor camps and that the physiology and socialization of women exposed them to different, different atrocities? No man could talk about giving birth in a concentration camp. No man would talk as much about rape if they talked at all about it. Women were extremely reluctant to talk about it, but we persisted, we meaning the feminist scholars, and we found that women survivors would talk about other women who were raped, but not about themselves. It took a long time for the trust to sink in uh, and for them to talk about what they really, really experienced. I you have one more minute, Myrna. Okay. I describe men and women's experiences as different horrors, same hell. Clearly, my morning in, in Mauthausen shaped my career and my life. How many people plan vacations around visits to concentration camps or death camps? I like to believe that I, perhaps I helped shape the research on the Holocaust, broadening it to include women as well as men. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thank you for also staying within our, our time frame. Um, I'm going to turn now to our next speaker, Professor Sarah Horowitz. She's Professor of Comp Lit and Humanities and the former director of the Israel and Golda Koshitsky Center for Jewish Studies at York University in Toronto. She's the author of Voicing the Void, Muteness and Memory in Holocaust Fiction, which received the Choice Award for Outstanding Academic Book. Sarah, you're on. Oh, thanks so much, Marion. Uh, I just wanna press a timer so I can start and actually time myself as well. Um, uh, Judy, I wanna say that I remember well our conversation in Jerusalem those years ago. And I remember a phrase that you said at the time, uh, borrowing from something that was uh, current then, you said it takes a village. And uh, it strikes me that we have actually gathered, thanks to you, in a village of sorts. And so, uh, yes, it takes a village and villages can um, cross all sorts of uh, boundaries, um, geographic boundaries, pandemic boundaries, and uh, I'm really grateful for being pulled together. Um, I, I'm going to talk about, as, as Judy asked, how I came to think about looking at women and the Shoah. And oddly enough, I came to it initially and largely through reading narratives by men, uh, and then by being in conversation with women survivors. At the time that I became interested in women in the Holocaust, my academic work, which is to say my, um, my publishing and my teaching, followed two tracks. Uh, first, I was looking at Shoah narratives, fiction, memoir, narrative poems. And secondly, I was doing feminist work, thinking about gender and women's studies in the context of Jewish literature. But initially, for me, these were two very separate tracks. They weren't, uh, they weren't brought together. Um, and yet I found myself, as I wrote, as I read, and particularly as I taught and read aloud and had my students read aloud, read aloud I found myself flagging passages, images, and tropes in narratives by men that focused on women. That is, I was interested, I became interested in men representing women, both in memory narratives and in contemporaneous writing, that is writing during the time of the Holocaust. And I flagged these, these passages and these images because they struck me as in some way being discordant, not necessarily false, but my sense that there was something going on in them, there was something being articulated through them beyond the surface meaning or the uh, information conveyed. Um, and I began to um, think about the ways in which um, certain experiences that were narrated were conveying not only information, but they were ways of signaling aspects of inner experiences and existential issues and crises 
and that these male narratives used women in particular ways. And I began to trace scenes that persisted through different kinds of writing by particular authors, scenes that I saw morph and I saw gender shifting as these certain scenes might uh, move from one kind of writing to another by the same author. And I began to ask myself, what did women stand for in writing by women? And at the time, I had a colleague in African American studies, and he was um, beginning to ask similar questions about narratives by former slaves, that is by men who were writing memoirs after they were emancipated. And our conversations brought our work in contact, and we realized we were seeing some of the, the same things. Um, and so I'll, I'll give you just uh, two, two really brief examples. Uh, many of you are familiar, of course, with Shimon Uberband, who was part of the Arnik Shabbos project in the Warsaw Ghetto. And I, I sort of looked at the way he described men going to mikvah when it was forbidden and women going to mikvah. And when he talked about men, um, he crafted a scene um, that was all about heroism and connection with Jewish heroism in the past. But when he described women, he was talking about humiliation. Um, and I wondered, I began to wonder how women's narratives, both contemporaneous and memory narratives, shape themselves around similar moments. What kinds of patterns of narration, modes of memory developed there, and what could be what could we learn from it? Um, I was interested in women seeing themselves rather than men looking at women, projecting onto them. Um, at the time, and I think uh, many of you remember this. Um, people in the field, many people in the field, the dominant attitude was that looking at women asking these kinds of questions would lead to a dead end at best, and at worst, craft a distorted and ideologically driven and diminished kind of work. Uh, people would say to me, well, okay, if, you, if I can give you a memoir blind, that is to say, you don't know who wrote it, and you read it, and you can tell me whether the author is a man or a woman, then maybe there's some legitimacy to what you're doing. And so um, that, that's kind of typical of, of some of the resistance that I encountered. But as word got around that I was interested in women's memoirs, um, women survivors found their way to me. They were looking for a listening ear. They handed to me unsolicited, unpublished manuscripts. And uh, as I got to know them, I would receive many, many late night phone calls with women who were just intent on talking to me and talking to me and talking to me about their memories. And I said to myself, why me? Well, I was a receptive listener, and that's part of how um, uh, testimony becomes conveyed, the perception that someone is interested in what you said. But I also think it was because I was, uh, at least initially, a stranger to them. And there are things that are easier to say to strangers than to intimates, things that women explicitly told me, I can't say this to my children, but I want to say it to someone. Um, and, uh, and so the range of um, memories by women that I, I could think about and that I could look at um, kind of grew. There were published memoirs, unpublished memoirs, interviews, uh, conversations. Um, and yeah, I began, yeah, to, yes, and I began to ask myself, what sets of experiences, memories did their narratives contain that were unrepresentative or totally absent in women's narratives? What kinds of tropes developed in women's writing and women's speaking? What images and narrative patterns emerged that told us not only about what women experience, things that may be um, perhaps biologically or socially linked to them, but also um, these narratives were also means through which they could tell you how they negotiate trauma. Oops, sorry, this was my own timer. How they negotiate trauma, memory, crises, and um, and even ethics. It's, it's and seven so, minutes. Yes, and so this was a way of bringing not only women's experiences but women's thinking to the forefront. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah. Um, and now I would like to introduce Le Professor Lenore Weitzman. Lenny, are you able to speak? Yes, I yes. can't see. Is that a yes or a no? Yes. Okay, yes, good. 
Um, let me introduce you then. Um, she is the author of five books, including the award-winning The Divorce Revolution and the pioneering volume with Dahlia O'Fair on women in the Holocaust. She was a professor at Stanford, Harvard, University of California, and George Mason, and is currently the vice president of the Jewish Book Council. And she had a very bad sore throat, so we are very grateful if she can say anything. Thanks. Um, so forgive my voice. Um, I've chosen to go back to the early days and to talk about something that I've actually never spoken about in public. It was a period when I felt like my life was falling apart and I didn't know how to cope. I was an associate professor of sociology at Harvard. I was coming up for tenure and I had six months to finish the book I was writing before my review. My mother was living alone in Florida after my father died and I got a call saying she was in the hospital because she had had a stroke. I rushed down to Florida to be with her and I was able to hire a caretaker who would go home with her before I flew back to Boston to teach my classes. The following week, the caretaker called crying, telling me that she had accidentally shot my mother when she was transferring her to a wheelchair, and my mother had broken her hip, and she'd probably have to have surgery. My mother was the single most important person in my life, and she was all alone, and she needed me. I couldn't let her go through this alone, and I had to be with her. I couldn't focus on writing, even if I wanted to. I wrote a long letter asking for the semester off to take care of her, carefully outlining in a typical legal argument, the case for family leave to cover parents as well as childcare. At that time, my field was sociology of law. I had published and I was teaching a 200 student course on women in the law. I was keenly aware of the way in which women's roles as caretakers disadvantaged them at work. And I urged the university to adopt a policy that would help mitigate these disadvantages. It didn't help. The dean said no. Harvard was not going to approve a family leave for, for parents, and I later heard that Dean was afraid it would set a dangerous precedent, even though he told my chair he admired my articulate brief. I then thought of taking an unpaid leave and talked to several senior members of my department, who at the time were all men, and they were, of course, opposed. It would reflect my lack of commitment to my profession. One professor even boasted to me that he was proud of the fact that he didn't attend his father's funeral because it conflicted with the class he had to teach. I was appalled. But despite their dire predictions of how it was going to jeopardize my career, all I could think about what was happening to my mother and I couldn't abandon her. And of course, as I wrote those words for the, the article in the book, uh, the words I couldn't abandon my mother had so many reverberations for, for me and for those of us who write about women in the Holocaust. And I just couldn't help but think of all the vivid descriptions of daughters refusing to leave their mothers and clinging to them, especially in the work of Marion Kaplan and Felicia Karai. I took the unpaid leave. I spent most of the next six months in Florida with my mother. The time saved her. The doctors told us she would never walk again, and we proved them wrong. And we both cried when she took her first steps. In hindsight, those difficult months also turned out to be equally valuable for me because they brought me to the Holocaust and to a new field that changed my life. It was a circuitous path. At first, I just couldn't think of anything academic and couldn't focus. As someone who had been such a strong advocate for women to persist in other spheres, I had totally lost my ability to formulate a strategy and to get my life back on, strap, on track. I decided I had to find out how others had coped with adversity. And the worst situation I could imagine was to be a Jew trapped in the Holocaust. So I turned to Holocaust memoirs for lessons. By chance, I had taken Leisha Rose's book, The Tulips Are Red, with me to Florida because I had recently met her at a conference. Lisa was a nurse in the Jewish hospital in Amsterdam who became a courier for the Dutch resistance. Passing as a non-Jew, she braved her way through many difficult and dangerous situations. I was so inspired by her book that I started reading every survivor memoir I could find. I was totally obsessed. Every, every woman's memoir I was reading and I was reading it over and over again. Although it sounds counterintuitive, these memoirs actually changed the way I looked and felt about my own situation. When I read about what they endured, my problems were minor. And when I read about their courage and determination, I felt as if I was gaining strength from them. By the end of my six month leave, I decided to change the focus of my academic work and to change my life and to work on the Holocaust. It was an enormous decision because I had absolutely no scholarly credentials and I knew I would need several years to just catch up. But Lisa's story led me to want to study Jews who survived the Holocaust by passing, something I had actually even never heard about or even imagined before I read her book. 
I was incredibly lucky to get a Fulbright Fellowship at Israel at Yad Vashem to undertake that research. And actually, Mordechai, I remember you was the one of the first people I spoke to that year. And a year after my mother died, my husband, William Good, and I arrived in Jerusalem. He had been a chair professor of sociology at Columbia and had many former colleagues and students in Israel and were welcomed as a family in a way that seemed only possible in Israel. It turned out to be an enormously productive and personally fulfilling year. And I say this because instead of becoming depressed by the subject of the Holocaust, as many of my, my Harvard colleagues have predicted, I began a new career with support and encouragement of a wide, wide circle of friends and family in Israel. I just, I doubt that it could have been possible anywhere else at that time. In fact, when I briefly returned to Cambridge, I ran into a colleague who I thought was a friend, another senior member of my department, and I told him how excited I was, and he told me I was crazy to specialize, specialize in the Holocaust. It was just a historical event. It had no theory, and no one would consider it a legitimate area of study. Besides, it was too depressing. He urged me for my own good, and I know this echoes many other testimonies, to reconsider what I was doing because he cared about me. I really do believe he cared about me, and he was trying to prevent me what he thought was ruining my career. But he was wrong, and I'm so glad that I had the sense to realize it, and it turned out to be a wonderful career. I hope the essay in my book speaks to that and proves him wrong. But because my talk has been so personal, I want to end by just mentioning two other serendipitous events of that year that have profoundly influenced my life. The first grew out of my research on Jews who passed as non-Jews during the Holocaust. While interviewing survivors in Israel, I was fortunate to have a number of to meet a number of women who were passing, but who were totally unlike the other Jews who were passed. It turned out one minute. You know, it turns out that these women were kashariot, the couriers of the Jewish resistance, and the subject of the book that I'm now completing. Um, it's important to say that because I agree with so many others about how much I learned from survivors. And I just want to note that their voices are still with me today and have given me a unique perspective on what's happening today. In contrast to many of my friends who are so anxious and seem almost paralyzed, um, I keep thinking of something that Branka Klebanski said, we had to do something. We, anything, we had to do something. And for me, that anything has been spending the past two months organizing and delivering food for food pantries. Our small pantry of 12 people has now grown to feeding 500 families a week. The second third serendipitous event, and I will end with this, was having a lunch with Zalia Offer at the end of my Fulbright year after she finally returned to Israel after her sabbatical year abroad. That lunch plan led us to plan a conference, then to jointly edit a book, to become lifelong friends and colleagues. And as they say, the rest is history. Thank you very much. I want to thank all the panelists for both their personal and their intellectual journeys and um, telling it to us so beautifully. I want to now go to the second panel, which is the later journeys, and um, introduce Federica Schumann, who is going to be the moderator. So Federica Clementi Schumann is Associate Professor in the Department of English, Language, and Literature in the College of Arts and Sciences at the University of South Carolina. She's the author of Holocaust Mothers and Daughters, Family, History, and Trauma, and the recipient of the Florence Howe Award for Feminist Scholarship from the Modern Language Association Women's Caucus. So I turn it over to Federica. Thank you, thank you all. Thank you, Judy. Thank you, Dalia. Thank you, everybody, for having me here and for the incredible opportunity of working with you on this fantastic book. Um, I will. Um, the The session I'm introducing today goes under the uh, self-explanatory rubric of later journeys, and my introductions. Um, will not do any justice to the incredible bibliography and contributions of each speaker, so my sincere apologies. Um, but um, you will hear, of course, from them directly, and the speakers come in alphabetical order, and each, as you know, will have uh, strictly seven minutes to, to, to talk. I will signal at the second when there are two minutes left and then one minute left. Um, without further ado, I want to leave um, room to the speakers. Uh, our panel today starts, um, is opened by Sarah Cushman, who is the director of the Holocaust Educational Foundation at Northwestern University. 
and a lecturer in the Department uh, of History. And she earned her doctorate in Holocaust history from Clark University and the research centers on women's experiences during the Holocaust. So Sarah, to you now. Good afternoon. First, some thank yous uh, to Judy and Dahlia for inviting me to be a part of the volume in this gathering, to the other participants for their wonderful work in collegiality, to other scholars who work on women and gender during the Holocaust, and uh, to Federica and the other panelists. I'm honored to be among you today. Um, I am sure, sorry about that. I'm sure that uh, that's true for many of you here. Um, I've spent a lot of time over the past two weeks with the ongoing movement for racial justice and equity in the United States on my mind and in my heart. Thinking about that and about uh, what to say today regarding my entry into and my work in the field of women in the Holocaust, I thought it, thought it might make sense for me to begin with my years as an undergrad. I did not start out as a as history major, but realized uh, relatively quickly that history is my calling. The history then tugging at both my head and heartstrings was African American women's history. It is a history that is important and central to U.S. history. It is history whose uh, legacy is ongoing racism and white supremacy, and it is a history that I think everyone should know about. Uh, after college, I took a 10-year hiatus from the world of academia and returned in my early 30s to pursue a doctoral degree in Holocaust and Genocide Studies. Uh, my earlier studies in African American women's history contributed to my interest in studying women's experiences during the Holocaust. And like that history, I believe that this history is important and central to world history, that its legacy is evident in widespread anti-Semitism, and it is a history that everyone should know something about. Now, what do I do with that? Uh, just this past Thursday, I held my last class of the quarter. I taught a group of 15 students a course titled Gender, Race, and the Holocaust. While we all began the class with great skepticism about how we would be able to connect as a learning community through Zoom, we ended thinking the class went well and having learned a lot. This is in no small part because of the topic. It allowed space for students to talk about how they were coping with the pandemic, and then more recently, or very recently, the space to talk about police brutality and race and gender and power in the United States. The course reflected some of the current trends in the study of gender in the Holocaust, including the idea that everyone has gendered experiences, including men. Gender shaped how men participated in and responded to Nazi racial policies in Nazi Germany, Nazi-occupied Europe, the killing fields, concentration camps, in hiding, and resistance in various contexts. Of course, we also spent a significant amount of time focused on women's experiences as perpetrators and as targets. We read Marion Kaplan's Between Dignity and Despair, Wendy Lauer's Hitler's Furies, and Gisela Pearl's I Was a Doctor in Auschwitz, which has recently come back into print thanks to, the two, of my to two of my colleagues at Northwestern University. The topic for the uh, final week of class was sexuality and sexual violence. We focused narrowly on concentration camps, reading Anna Heikova's article on sexual barter in Theresienstadt, an article by Robert Sommer on Pipples, and for the first time I asked my students to read an article of mine. This was a recently published chapter on sexuality, sexual barter, and sexual violence in Auschwitz, and I'll spend my last few minutes speaking very uh, briefly about that. I make two major arguments in the article. One is that Auschwitz, despite Nazi attempts to dehumanize prisoners in part through degendering, was a highly gendered place. And the second is that women at some levels of the camp hierarchy had a degree of sexual agency. Women's sexual agency and the gendered structures of Auschwitz become apparent when we look at women's sexuality. Starvation, filth, disease, exhaustion, brutality, and lack of privacy, time, and space discouraged and impeded prisoners' attempts to form all types of relationships, including sexual relationships. Survivors who write of sexuality focus primarily on what they perceived as aberrant, homosexuality, exchange of sex for necessities, forced prostitution, and sexual slavery. I view these as exploitation and survival strategies as do many of, of you. Uh, as in many sex-segregated environments, female same-sex encounters may have been more prevalent than in non-segregated segregated contexts. There are several reasons for this. Some women simply identified as lesbian, others may have sought same-sex relationships due to the inaccessibility of men and hunger for companionship, still others used sex in exchange for food. Exchange of sex for food characterized some heterosexual encounters as well. Not all women who had the opportunity for sexual barter took it. Some viewed it as moral degradation, prostitution, a threat to their female identity. For them, refusal constituted a form of resistance. For others, however, survival was the moral imperative. Survival by any means was resistance. 
Various degrees of coercion characterized these exchanges. Even so, some women act, not, acted not only as agents of their own physical survival, but also as people with needs for physical contact and pleasure. Women's attempts to find pleasure, even if fleeting, are a form of agency, an assertion of some kind of right to bodily integrity in a place where annihilation predominated. Sexual exploitation and coercion by other prisoners and camp personnel characterized many sexualized interactions. Sexualized violence was a way of asserting power over others in a highly racialized context, characterized by impunity for abuse of prisoners. I include two examples of female perpetrators in sec of sexualized violence in my article. Both were women guards. Understanding sexualized violence solely as an assertion of male power over women obscures that the fact that women also perpetrated such acts. Gender and race were factors in sexualized violence during the Holocaust, as during other genocides, even if they took different forms. Women's experiences as victims of rape, sexual slavery, prostitution, and other forms of sexual exploitation during times of war and genocide are worthy of deep and committed scholarly attention, and I explore that in my work as well. But scholars have rarely focused on women as sexual agents. Agency is not necessarily positive, it does imply responsibility. We could see resistance in the sexual agency of women prisoners, but some women prisoners may have coerced others into sexual interactions, and sexualized violence of women camp personnel was nothing less than perpetration. Well, gendered maybe. experiences and gendered structures influenced the shape of victimization, resistance, and perpetration in the women's camp in Auschwitz-Birkenau. It is important that we recognize women as authors, and objects of sexuality and violence in that context. Now I'd like to end back on a more personal note, delving, in, delving into topics such as this, which deal with the individual, individual human toll of mass violence has continued to open my mind and my heart to the personal stories of those around me. I'm grateful for the opportunity to share some of my story with you and to hear yours. The richness of our scholarship is enhanced by knowing something of the people who carry it out. I remain honored to be a part of this group and look forward to hear the, hearing the remaining stories. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sarah. Thank you for bringing old history and new contemporary history together uh, in such a wonderful, uh, moving way. And I guess on behalf of everybody, I applaud your talk. And now next uh, speaker is Dorota Gwobatska, Professor of Humanities at the University of King's College in Halifax, Canada. Her teaching and research interests include Holocaust and genocide studies, gender studies, philosophy of race, and critical theory. Uh, Dorota, it's your turn. Thank you, Fredju, and thank you, Judy. I'm a latecomer to the field, and my chapter in the book is written as a narrative of a long and winding journey toward becoming a feminist Holocaust scholar. And in writing the chapter, I was guided by a sentence in Hannah Arendt's The Human Condition, the chief characteristic of this specifically human life is that it is itself full of events which ultimately can be told as a story. And my story involved an exploration of a tangled nexus of identities, such as being a woman, a Polish Jew, a daughter of a Holocaust survivor, an academic, and a first generation immigrant, although I've never settled fully into any one of these categories. Uh, I left Poland in 1989 for graduate school to study continental philosophy. My doctoral thesis on French philosopher Jean-Francois Lyotard did not include any female thinkers or references to the Holocaust, although at the time of writing the thesis, I also became interested in Polish Jewish history, Holocaust literature, and Jewish thinkers. So during the interview for the job at King's, where I still work today, I was asked what classes I'd like to teach besides continental philosophy, and I decided I would teach a class on the Holocaust, and that's how it started. And when during a visit to Poland that summer, I told my father that I had abandoned philosophy for Holocaust studies, uh, he opened up about his Holocaust experiences for the first time. So my Holocaust heritage is patrilinear, but the bonds I've built around it have been mostly with women. My newly discovered Jewish cousins, a Holocaust survivor who became my surrogate mother, and then a few years later, an entire community, a good part of which I can see on my screen right now. Um, I became a feminist because I'm contrary by nature. And at King's, I found myself in a conservative environment, one of only three female faculty members. Uh, behind our back, we were backs, we were called the Arinis. And in response, I designed a course in feminist literature and I became a feminist activist on campus and beyond on a mission to empower female and then also gender non-binary students. 
but I was hemmed into two areas of study, philosophy and Holocaust studies, both of which at the time lagged behind some other disciplines in terms of feminist consciousness. Hence, uh, being contrary, I became passionately interested in women's Holocaust experiences as well as in the lives of female philosophers, both of which revealed similar patterns of exclusion. It seemed that all women have been dispossessed from the ownership of the life stories. Uh, one of the first Holocaust papers I wrote was on Hannah Arendt and French philosopher Sarah Kaufman, two female thinkers who attained recognition on the philosophical Parnassus. The lives of both were affected by the Shoah, though in different ways, and both had a complicated relation with the Jewish heritage and with the Greco-Christian philosophical tradition in which the writings were ensconced. So Arendt and Kaufman helped me think about the exclusion of women's experiences in the socialist sanctioned narratives of the Holocaust within larger epistemic and sociocultural frameworks. Uh, generally, my love of theory was put to the test whenever I inflected it with gender, since writings by and about women challenged some of the basic parameters of these theoretical texts and exposed the hidden assumptions. A turning point in this regard was when researching another paper on Lyotard, I came across a short essay he wrote about Braha Ettinger, a French-Israeli painter and daughter of Holocaust survivors. Uh, Lyotard didn't pay much attention to that aspect of Ettinger's work, but for me it was a revelation. The encounter via Lyotard with Ettinger's art was a turning point in my thinking about Holocaust representations. It helped me develop ideas about witnessing in the feminine, the gender of memory, and gendered modes of representing history. I formulated my goals as shedding light on mechanisms of marginalizing women's experiences that remain invisible because they inhere in the very structures of knowledge and the language we use to describe them, even in acts of perception, such as, for instance, looking at photographs. So over the last 15 years, I've, been, I've often written about female artists of the second generation and more recently about representations of gender in Holocaust art. Although female artists are well represented in the art of the second generation in the older canon of Holocaust art, it's almost exclusively male artists whose mas masterpieces have been celebrated both for their aesthetic merit and the capacity to bear witness while works by women have been valued as documents of the time and thus housed exclusively in Holocaust or Jewish museums, but not in art galleries. So Professor Van Pelt's example of Preet Dika Brandis was telling. She was a gifted artist, uh, but she has been remembered for providing art therapy to children in Terajin, while her own paintings and drawings, many of which were produced in the camp, have been forgotten, unlike the famous works of Frita Unger and Fleischmann, uh, the, the main members of the Zeichenstube, uh, so I have three quick points to conclude this brief account of my journey toward becoming a feminist Holocaust scholar. First, it's been increasingly important to me to situate the questions about women's experiences in the Holocaust in comparative contexts, that is in relation to experiences of women in other instances of genocide and mass atrocity and in a larger context of the matrix of gender relations. I am now convinced that gender-based violence is not just one of the horrors of genocide, but that it inheres in dominant systems of gender as such. Uh, moreover, these systems of gender persevere at the very core of genocides as their enabling, even necessary condition. Uh, secondly, I'd like to acknowledge the obvious, namely that our approaches to the subject of women and the Holocaust differ based on our respective cultural contexts. I've given lectures and seminars on women's experiences in the Holocaust in Poland, and I had to translate the subject not only into my native tongue, but also into very different cultural understandings of gender, female agency, and female advocacy. And it was an engaged practice because, for instance, after one lecture, we went to a protest against Poland's draconian abortion laws, the so-called Black Friday. One minute, and, uh, one minute. I will finish ahead of time. Uh, so my, my last brief comment to conclude is that this journey uh, toward becoming a feminist Holocaust scholar brought me joy of working with extraordinary female scholars, female scholars and of developing lifelong friendships. 
and I would not be able to endure daily experiences of reading, writing, and teaching about rape, mass murder, and other forms of unspeakable violence without these interhuman connections. And thank you so much for allowing me to be here with you. Thank you. Thank you, Dorota. Thank you. And I know uh, better than anybody um, how incredibly committed you are to your activism, that your yours is not only theory but praxis because you help me so much with your syllabi, <laughs> your articles, your wonderful work, and uh, it, it's always meant a lot to me. So thank you. Uh, and now next speaker, Sonia Hetchpeth, professor of German at Middle Tennessee State University, where she has been teaching classes since 1989. Uh, she's the co-editor of the volume uh, Sexual Violence Against Jewish Women During the Holocaust, which was published by uh, UPNE uh, Brenner University Press uh, a few years back, 2010. Um, so, Sonia, tell us all you can about yourself that I can't squeeze into my presentation, into my introduction. Thank you, Fania, for that kind introduction. Hello, everyone, and thank you for including me today. I'm Born, I was born in 1952, so as I was an undergrad in the early 70s at the University of Texas at Austin, there was no such thing as um, Holocaust studies, as you've heard, Jewish studies, there was nothing. And in the field of German, what did we study? The standard texts. So, Jumping to forward to, so I, my, my growth as a, a feminist was an organic growth that grew with the women's movement at the time and also then deepening interest in Jewish studies. When I was a PhD student at Penn State University and I chose my dissertation topic, I was dissuaded, of course, like we have heard from many people do not write on a woman. And today my topic seems quite benign because I wrote on the German poet Else Lasker Schuler. So things that were Im impossible to think in the past, now I am so delighted to hear that people do these. They've, they've become things that we accept as a matter of course. And there are many women and men to think Thank for that, and many of you are here today. I want to say a few words about where I am at, and that is at an institution that gives support with non-support often. And over the years, I have taught at Middle Tennessee State University for 34 years in an environment that is interest uh, in people are interested in the Holocaust but oh, to a certain limit. So what I'm saying, I should be more direct, is in a very non-Jewish world, if you will. And bringing courses like that in as early as 1987 through 89 and throughout the years in the very beginning it was difficult and one always had to find allies, as many of you had to do at your institutions. I'm thinking of three student comments in the 80s that sort of were fence posts, if you will, for what, how, how academically one had to struggle. And one comment I distinctly remember is a student saying, Hedgepeth would be okay if she'd get off the women's thing. Uh, and another is, oh, I am so interested in the victimization of the Jews. And yet another comment I heard once was when I was going to teach a course on women and the Holocaust was, oh, I wish we had a course about all of the Holocaust that is something I would take. And my path has been very much professionally, as many of those that you have heard about. But I want to talk about, and many of you have alluded to, the friendships. I want to mention the great gift of working with someone 
who's a sharp thinker, dedicated and loyal and true. And many of you know her. Rochelle Seidel could not be here today, but as many of you know, we work very closely together. And that has helped to go through sometimes very dark places. So where we find partnership and where we can find cooperation, and yes, even in our academic settings where we can find a listener, where we can find friendship in exploring and pursuing new avenues of inquiry, we are indeed very lucky. And that has been my great luck. And I will close simply by saying that we've heard it, I will say it, academe is often a harsh environment to work in. We are actually paid to be critical and often there is this critical stance or I'll speak for myself, bleeds over into other areas that actually become dams or fences for, from working together better. In fact, I'll tell you that often the atmosphere of academe with its competition and criticism, I'll call it the judgment zone, has prevented us from working together. So I want to thank you all for being villagers, for being here today, and that our friendliness can continue as we find different ways to collaborate. Because certainly, as we've heard in our world today, we have the COVID-19 pandemic, we have Black Lives Matter. It's so important for us to take leadership in the things that we do. And even within the realm of women and the Holocaust, if it, even if it doesn't fit exactly what we're doing, that we model a kindness and a kind of at least professional friendship where we are willing to tune in and listen to each other. And I so delight in hearing more from all of you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Sonia. That's wonderful. And yes, I, I completely, um, I, I am so thankful that you brought up the issue of um, uh, uh, friendship and mentorship because, um, yeah, I myself would know where I would be without so many women mentors and guides. And Marion, I'm talking about you. <laughs> And uh, it's it's fundamental and how we turn ourselves into mentors for our students. And um, so thank you so much. That was really very beautiful. Thank you. Um, so now we are going to listen to, to, to listen to the story of Esther Herzog, Professor Emerita of Beit Ber Academ Academic College. Uh, she's a social anthropologist. She teaches and studies gender and bureaucracy at the Fath Academic College and is a social and feminist activist. Esther? Thank you. Thank you very much. And I would like to thank you, both Judy and Dahlia for this wonderful opportunity to meet you with all these, with all such prominent scholars in a feminist uh, study on the Holocaust. So my journey to the Holocaust research has hardly anything to do with the fact that both of my parents were Holocaust survivors. Being, being an active feminist explains better my profound interest in the study of the Holocaust from women's perspective. Only during the summer of 2000, when I, by chance, I came across the International Conference on the Holocaust held in Oxford, did I open up to the subject. This interest emerged from the unexpected exposure to feminist studies presented in the conference by feminist scholars. Coming back to Israel, I started to document my mother's story of her Shoah. My conversation with her took place for a whole year. While documenting my mother's Holocaust experiences, I realized that I knew almost nothing about it. Nevertheless, my mother played a significant role in the emergence of my personal feminist outlook on the Holocaust in studying this subject in publishing my insights and even in editing papers written by prominent scholars from Israel and abroad. While telling 
me about her Holocaust experiences interwoven in her present life narrative, I was overtaken by admiration for my mother. Her guts and fascinating insights struck me with understanding that fundamental human ethics lies in free, unbounded elaboration on human situations and conduct. I became a companion to my mother's emotional, verbal, and intellectual journey between places, periods, and ethical positions. My puzzled re reactions, or rather my latent suspicions regarding my mother's descriptions and views concerning people and events that were part of her past became an insep inseparable part of my reactions to her descriptions. In our conversations, my mother amazed me with unexpected associations and exclamations that inspired my way of thinking. Encouraged by my mother's daring to say things that should not be said, I allowed myself to question the widely accepted view that mothers going to the gas chambers with their children and endangering their own lives is an expression of utmost devotion. I dared to suggest that the subjugation of motherhood to social and cultural forces better explain women's readiness to sacrifice their lives for the sake of their offspring. Numerous women lost their lives when they walked into the crematoriums with their small children or died while trying to save them in the concentration camps or hiding places. This behavior was widely described as heroism, sacrifice, and etc. Thus, motherhood in the Holocaust has been idealized as a symbol of the sacrificing mother. This act of sacrifice and heroism is perceived as taken for granted or even self-evidently expected, expected as natural performance of women as mothers. Holocaust research implies that women are expected to pay tough prices, the most extreme of which is to give up their own lives as inseparable part of being mothers. Women's accounts about preferring to stay alive or to increase the chance of being saved, not giving up their lives for the sake of the children, have been silenced, marginalized, or denied. Women's acts of saving themselves were often perceived as deserting or abandoning their children. Such instances instances are often openly or implicitly um, uh, being, oh, let me see. Uh, uh, these, are of, these instances are often openly or implicitly condemned by both public discourse and scholars. My anti-essentialist thinking aligns with feminist scholars who perceive motherhood as a social construct, rejecting the concept that subordinates the woman's body and life to those of her offspring. Thus, the construction of the mother-child bond as natural and immutable is denied. Thus, I defy the widely accepted perception of mothers willing to walk towards death with children as heroic, and the linked condemnation of women who prioritize their own survival. This fatal behavior demonstrates the feminist interpretation of motherhood as a socially enforced and internalized role rather than reflecting heroism. Hence, for example, in our conversations, my mother repeatedly encountered the way her mother ended her life in the gas chamber while joining her sister, helping with her three small children. Yet, this act that is commonly interpreted as self-sacrifice can also be understood as an example of the feminine subjugating socialization that drives women to take care of children, even other women's children, and help caring for them, even at the exp expense of fatal personal price, such as lo losing their life. Questioning the glorification of mothers who are sacrificing their lives for their offspring unveils the fatal implications of women's socialization, giving up the right to use ch the chance to survive. Prioritizing the child life over that of the mothers raises a mother-child conflict. However, challenging the widely accepted implications of this dyad, I suggested that even the taken-for-granted preference of the child's life and welfare be, can be under, undermined depending on the circumstances. The profound social beliefs 
in the supremacy of the childhood as well as that of the sacrificing mother can easily serve to conceal the instrumental use. It is not surprising, therefore, that women's socializing mechanisms as mother, mothers were used by the Nazis to facilitate the extermination of immeasur immeasurable numbers of women, babies, and children. In, an in another, sorry? One more minute. Okay. In another context, that of the ghettos, the concern of the ghetto leaders for the collective's chances to survive caused them to control women's uh, reproduction. They prohibited women from giving birth by threatening to sanction them and their families. Such a practice was implemented, for instance, by the Judenrat of the Shoval ghetto, trying to force, to force abortions. In that context, giving birth and becoming a mother were perceived as unwanted and dangerous for the community and therefore condemned and penalized. I conclude then, that political and cultural approaches and practices concerning motherhood and the mother-child bond are adjusted to changing circumstances and various interests. Thus, a critical study and uncompromising comparative analysis of the Holocaust from women's perspectives are essential for women's, children's, and society's sake for both the research and social policy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, it's, uh, I, I suspect that the, um, there is a, still so much to be written about the mother daughters and the, the, the mothers, uh, the idea itself of motherhood in, 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 uh, in patriarchal society. It's, uh, it's, it's a fabulous uh, subject matter and uh, so much still awaits to be written and, and uncovered about it. It's, it's wonderful. And I wish I'd been there for your conversations with your mom. It must have been amazing. So yeah, thank, you, right. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So um, now it's Lisa Pine's turn. She's an uh, associate professor of history at London South Bank University, where she teaches modern history courses specifically on Nazi Germany and genocide. She's the author um, a, and or editor of uh, six books, and the most recent one this year, 2020. Congratulations, Mazeltov, The Family in Modern, Ge in modern Germany. Lisa, your turn. Okay, thank you very much and thank you Federica for such a kind introduction. I'm delighted to be part of this project among the pioneering scholars in the field who have influenced my own research and among colleagues whose tireless and important work has forged such a significant place now in the development of the historiography of the Holocaust. Taking part in this book was an opportunity for me, as I'm sure for all of you, uh, to reflect on my personal and professional identities, to look back on the path that led me to where I am today, and to recollect from childhood and family experiences, and also to think about where my future research may take me. My first foray into writing anything at all directly in the area of Holocaust studies was a request from Dan Stone to write a chapter for his edited book, um, called The Historiography of the Holocaust, and that's published, it's now way back in 2004, such a long time ago now. Um, so a chapter called uh, Gender and the Family. Of course, this was a very new and emerging uh, area of study at the time. Not so many scholars as we've already been discussing, having written on this previously. And my remit was to write about the state of the, of the academic literature. The main points, and not surprising to anyone here, is that the perspectives of gender, children, and the family uh, were becoming established within a broader field of Holocaust studies, and that it added an entirely new dimension to the historiography and to our understanding of the subject as a whole. Now, over the years, the main focus of my research and writing has centered on the social history of Nazi Germany. So in particular, on the on women and the family, on education and youth groups. But of course, these studies of the Third Reich could not preclude analysis of aspects of Nazi anti-Semitism and the Holocaust, because these formed an intrinsic part of what Nazism was about and the consequences of its government. So at the same time as doing that work, I continued to give some attention to looking more at gender in the Holocaust and came to consider a need to explore female Holocaust narratives over the course of a number of years. 
And I was looking at the importance of the social construction of female identities um, and the role and the and roles of that in the history of the Holocaust, analyzing the structural differences of um, gender, sorry, the structural sources of gender difference in relation to Nazi persecution before the war, looking at the distinctions between the ways in which Jewish men and women experienced the Holocaust. Um, again, looking at both male and female survivor accounts um, to really illustrate the points. And actually sort of quite specifically on where we were meant to be at this, um, at this uh, museum in New York today and, and the exhibition there, uh, most of my work kind of in the end focused in this field, focused on two gender related experiences at Auschwitz itself. So looking at um, imprisonment at Auschwitz with women having to opt for agency and make choices in a variety of ways that were distinctive from those made by men. So I was looking at female behavior that conformed to traditional gender norms. Um, and again, we, I don't need to outline those here, but also considering female behavior that differed from the expected type. So there was kind of just this um, desire, I think, in what I was trying to do to try and look at what was missing in what was missing in what had been written, what, 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 what hadn't been told, what, what, um, what wasn't in there. Um, sometimes looking at difficult um, aspects, um, not with the intention of judging, but to offer a more complete uh, and a more nuanced understanding of Holocaust experiences. And I wanted to share now here too, a few words on the impact of this subject on me as a researcher. I'm sure it will resonate with many of you. Obviously it's not an easy subject to work on, but it is one I regard as significant and compelling. Seeking to understand the enormity of the Holocaust um, survivor memoirs and testimonies has been essential. Um, and so the impact of that, obviously such harrowing work um, to read through survivor memoirs, testimonies, um, especially when you're really immersed in it, as I know many of you have been, um, over a sustained amount of time, really Im immersed in this world um, of horror and in particular um, at Auschwitz. And the exposure to these stories have had a profound impact on me. I think on all of us, we internalize their words, they change us. Uh, we take on some of the emotional pain too through reading their accounts or talking to survivors. And again, so the, as, as many of you have already commented on, I think that the kind of a supportive work system, forms of discussion with colleagues working on a similar uh, or the same areas, um, and particularly this group of scholars um, in Judy's wonderful forum, um, has been so beneficial in this regard because I think as for all of us it gives us the sense that we're not alone in our endeavors and a camaraderie with other scholars in the field which has been very important to me um, as, as, as I've worked in this field. I, it's important to me too to tell the stories of survivors whenever I have the opportunity obviously to my students at the university but at talks in secondary schools and at academic conferences and I've been fortunate for, to present aspects of this work um, not just in the UK but in Denmark, Poland, South Africa and the USA too and not just at history conferences but also at multi multidisciplinary ones. So um, just some cl concluding thoughts um, that working in this field has given me an appreciation of the courage and resilience of Holocaust survivors. The will to survive and bear witness is an enduring part of the human spirit and survivors are a testament to this. Despite the trauma and horror that they experienced, um, they went on to start new lives, tell their narratives in order to encourage toleration and create a better world through the presentation of their experiences. It's been very satisfying and intellectually rewarding and fruitful for me to engage um, in this research. Um, and in terms of future research and writing, I still intend to work uh, more in the field of Holocaust studies, um, as well as other aspects on the history of Nazi Germany, the Second World War and its um, impact on civilian populations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Lisa. I look forward to reading your book <laughs> and uh, it sounds fantastic and, um, and families are so, I mean, I think we just, it, it's the most, I think, one of the greatest uh, contribution by feminists and women scholars to have really brought the family and the details of the everyday lives, either of the victims as well as of the perpetrators or the bystanders to really look at the family as this microcosm that is so important for the understanding of the larger 
uh, history um, that uh, we, we try to examine. And um, so that's, that's a wonderful contribution. Thank you. I look forward to reading it and sharing it with my students. Thank so, you. and now, uh, and now um, Louise Vasfery, uh, it's uh, the last speaker, yes, on, on, on this panel. She is Professor Emerita at Stony Brook University, but she currently teaches at NYU. Her field is in medieval studies, diachronic and sociolinguistics, Holocaust studies and Hungarian studies, all informed by gender theory with a broader framework of comparative cultural studies. Louise, your turn. Uh, thank you. It's uh, not really easy to be the last speaker after so many exciting talks and so many points in common. So some things have been said, obviously, that I might say. But in another way, perhaps it's fitting that I speak last because I am at the same time probably the youngest member here, hold that thought with me, and at the same time, one of the oldest. <laughs> that is, by the dates of my Holocaust studies, I belong among the so-called newer voices in our book, but both by chronological and academic age, I'm one of the oldest. So perhaps because of that, because my journey was so long, uh, my talk is perhaps a bit more personal and professional before my Holocaust work, and I will talk more about that. I belong to the one and a half generation, born in Budapest, but during the week of the doomed Warsaw Uprising. I come from a mixed family, very important for my life and for my later writings in the Holocaust. My assimilated grandparents survived in Budapest in the Budapest ghetto. My Gentile grandfather was deported to Dachau, some Gentile relatives were later recognized in Yad Vashem. So again, a mixed family, which is again very important for me. In my childhood, I was very attached to older relatives on both sides, heard lots of stories, all of them born in the multi-ethnic Austro-Hungarian Empire who had gone through the two wars and communism there. My roots are very deep in Hungary and in the Hungarian language, but in childhood, I became a refugee in several countries and in several languages. It is unquestionably my Hungarian diasporic background that ultimately brought me to steady women in the Holocaust. But then why did it take me 30 years into my academic career to become a feminist Holocaust researcher? While, as, as I just said, the principal factors have to do uh, with my family history, I need to involve and invoke the intellectual and cultural forces that shaped my generation of American feminist scholars. I got my PhD in Berkeley at the end of the 60s, so that already begins to tell us something. It was a difficult decade of male-dominated radicalism. Let's bring that forth. Nevertheless, it did lead to gradual emergence of feminist consciousness in the women's movement, one example, in Berkeley, it was in the fall of 1969, so already very end, that the very first female graduate student caucus began to challenge male-centered curriculum and to create undergraduate courses about women authors. This all done by graduate students, of course, most of whom didn't make a career afterwards because they were activists. Of course, at the same time, there were very few women, women, women professors and almost no, none tenure. Okay, my own field was at that time romance philology and for the first decades of my career and to some degree to today, my, a lot of my work is in medieval and pre-modern studies and in linguistics. But both have over the years increasingly th were theorized by concerns of gender and sexuality, including quite early queer sexualities. In 1984, I co-taught one of the first courses anywhere in women in language. No Holocaust, but women and women's speech, which became very important later. In those years in the 80s, I also held the position of associate vice provost, which kept me from research for a while, but where I did have lots of opportunities to experience academic gender issues of all kinds of negative sorts that you can imagine. By the 90s, by the early 90s, I still had no direct involvement in Holocaust research as such, 
nor did anyone else in my large public university, even though for a time I was director of Judaic studies, but I can't get into that, and yet no Holocaust. But I did begin to read seriously, becoming particularly immersed in academic, immigrant, and Holocaust writing of women mostly, but of both genders. That is, I became hooked on what has been called now autobiographical reading, reading in order to understand one's own life experiences. So in 2002, when Imre Kertes won the Nobel Prize, maybe I was finally ready. There was no scholarly work on him at all in English, not that much in Hungarian either, but that's again another story. This led another refugee Gentile Hungarian scholar and myself to publish Imre Kertes Holocaust Literature. And in that decade, we published, uh, whew, my goodness, uh, several other things. Then I need to, uh, I realized soon that uh, my insights derived from feminist theory and queer criticism as an analysis of difference were relevant to my reading of women's Holocaust memoirs. I started working on that. Soon I realized that the corpus available in English writings by was not enough, that there was all this communist bloc writing by women in Eastern European languages. I speak a number of those languages, but particularly, of course, Hungarian, which had a different Holocaust history. So I started working a lot on that. I, did, I was not able to say my work in Hungary, but much like Dorota, I've also been working and lecturing and teaching in Hungary, and that's a whole other world. How do you study this and, and write about it in both of those languages and those very different cultures and what, what is happening there? So my ultimate aim is to represent through women's testimonies a communality of uh, memory, that is a collective study, of the common characteristics of the historical group whose individual biographies will remain largely untraceable. And as I said at the beginning, uh, I felt like the last survivor of a polyglot Central European culture destroyed before I was born, but I continue obsessed with the responsibility of passing that collective memory through the retrieval of as many women's voices as possible. And last sentence, that is relevant for a closing here for all of us, I think. As Marion Kaplan writes in the introduction to our volume, our essays too are more than individual stories, much like those earlier stories, although we don't compare our situation to theirs. And they also tell a collective story. I think our stories too need to be read together. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. Thank you. It was a great conclusive uh, uh, concluding speech uh, talk and you brought it all together very nicely. Thank you. And I'm absolutely moved and impressed by all we heard today. And um, it is now my uh, great privilege to leave the virtual podium to Dahlia of for her closing remarks. Dahlia is the Max and Rita Haber Professor Emerita of Holocaust and East European Studies at the Hebrew University in Jerusalem. Her main research areas are the Holocaust in Eastern Europe, women in the Holocaust, memory of the Holocaust and immigration to Palestine and to Eretz Israel. And together with Judy Tader Baumel Schwartz, she is the reason why most of us, all of us, I guess, are here today. Uh, they co edited the volume, Her Story, My Story which was of course the springboard for this conference. And thank you, Dali, and thank you, Judy. And now the podium to you. Thank you very much. Well, it's my last few sentences now uh, after everybody already said what he had to say. And I will start from a few personal remarks. First of all, I'm really glad to see all of you Many of you I know, but some I didn't know ahead of time. And I didn't have the chance, as Judy had, to meet all of you. So now it's not only essays, it's faces, it's sounds, it's body language, although with some kind of limitation of uh, the Zoom, but it's really very, very nice. The second is that rereading the essays, uh, when I received the book, and actually I received it only three weeks ago, because probably of the, the university was closed, it uh, reinforced my feeling that I had when I first read your text. What I thought is that I would really like to sit in many of your lectures. It sounded so interesting and so enriching. 
And the third personal comment relates to my reading list, which really grew significantly. I know that I will never be able to read all the novels, monographs, memoirs that you quoted and analyzed in your work. Nevertheless, it reinforced my feeling that though I know quite a bit on the Holocaust, I still have so much to learn, a feeling that I'm very thankful for, as a matter of fact. After many years that I researched and taught the Holocaust in high school and in the university, I know that even if I live 100 lives, I will only touch a portion of this enormous cataclysm. Reading each article while reviewing and proofing is totally a different experience to the reading the published work. Judy and myself discuss different op options how to structure the book, what order the articles should appear. We wanted the articles to converse with one another, yet also to highlight their diversity. We hoped that the sequence of the book would enhance the voice of the authors and that the readers would be able to hear the conversation and appreciate the voices of different authors. This was our prime goal for the book. Reading it now as a published work, I was struck by how the discussions have become more rich and more powerful. It reads like an orchestra of voices. I almost heard how the articles speak to each other, not only because their autobiographical perspective, but also because the similar and different concerns, questions, feeling of rage and compassion that were expressed by different authors. Major themes, that the researchers raised include the impact of parents, survivors on their children, and we heard it today, the search for a theory connected between different academic fields, and we also heard this today, the field of memory and post-memory of survivors and second generation, or generation and a half, one and a half generation, as you said, uh, Louise, I have now a PhD student who works on this one and a half generation. The legitim legitimacy of literary rep representation of the Holocaust and the fact that history is a prime discipline in the research of the Holocaust. The researchers in this volume deliberated these issues in a rich and nuanced way. It is interesting to read the writer's self-awareness in relating to their own development with great honesty that give the accounts of their reactions, patient or restlessness towards senior scholars, and we heard it also today, who criticize their work in the past and the way they view it today with, when they are writing the essay. Most reconcile with their past and appreciate both their difficulties and successes which contributed to their academic work. Others still rage with male scholars who did not appreciate gender in the field of research or think that the Holocaust should not be represented in core curricula or in academic conferences that are not entirely dedicated to the Holocaust. Another interesting observation which appears from reading the articles is the diverse motivation and factor that encouraged each of, the, each of the researchers to enter the academic research of the Holocaust. It highlighted how instrumental the academic community and academic discipline was in determining the topic of the research, and again, we heard about it today, and how it shaped their academic language and conceptualization of the Holocaust. One of the aspects that impressed me most, both as a historian 
and that the reader of literature on the Holocaust of different disciplines is a contribution of different methodologies to the field. I'll say a few sentences on this. It is impressive to read the quest for a theory across the disciplines by sociologists, researchers of literature, memory, and more. Sociologists are looking for categories or social models. Researchers of literature, from a certain point, examine the modernist theory and were disappointed by the limited, limited attention to literary works on the Holocaust and look to move them into the center stage that they deserve. Scholars of, scholars of memory call to listen to survivors' testimony and contribute their analysis to understanding the, both the past and the present. Researchers of feminism, often social and political activists, were debating whether the primacy of race rather than gender changed basic stereotypes of women and men. Were gender hierarchies of power, status, and influence modified due to the radical reality and the destruction of everyday life. Some of the social scientists and philosophers doubted the hegemony of history. They asked if the quest for finding more and more facts and nuances of gender relation during the Holocaust were meaningful contributions to the field. Or would it not encourage an essentialism in gender relations? And I think we also heard this echoes today. And the last but not least, the contribution of culture studies to Holocaust research. In general, I'm sorry, the contribution of cultural studies to Holocaust research in general and to women in the Holocaust in particular. I felt that this subject encompassed much of the issues and problematized them in a way that each discipline could gain from its conceptualization. I assume that now you can understand better my opening saying that I could sit as a student in many of your courses. I want to thank Judy, which is really a dear friend, and we already did one book together. She was really the driving force. I was a second wheel in this project and she deserves all, all the appreciation and admiration that I have. And I want also to mention Lenor, which I call Lenny, and this is the way we call. And you, re you could read it in my essay because she was personally my driving force uh, to do this work. And I am very thankful and appreciative to all of you, friends, and now friends, new friends, for being here together. Thank you so much. Okay, everybody. Thank you very much, Dahlia. I'm going to take over for one second at the end, as we do have a moment. I thank you all for being here. And everyone has spoken about community. I have recorded this entire conference on my computer, but doing so in what's called speaker view, which means that you could only see the person who was speaking and two or three people above. I'm about to change the view on my computer to gallery view. And now who's ever going to see this eventually, will see all of us together in one picture and we'll see the community that we have managed to form. So I send, Hugs to all of you. I thank you all for being here with us today, this morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where we are at the moment. And this community will continue. Thank you all for being with us. I thank all of those who are listening and who will eventually view this. I hope that you have enjoyed it as much as I have. Good afternoon, good night, to be continued. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.